Welcome back to another TCR Interviews. Our guest this episode is a Counter-Strike legend. He played for Team 3D and Complexity, just to name a few. Most recently, you saw him coaching Team Complexity and NA Juggernaut Cloud9. Please welcome to the show 2001-ish CompUSA Counter-Strike Tournament Champion Rambo. Oh, hello, hello. Thank you. Thank How you for having are me you, on. dude? Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, a little applause. I love it. <laughs> we have you production know, value here, okay? This is top of <laughs> the top line notch. podcast. Top notch. You know, so it's funny because Tim mentions CompUSA, and this is a, a big joke. So I, I got to go back 15 plus years now. So we're going back to like 2001, 2002, 16-year-old Anu just sitting in his room and gets introduced to Counter-Strike for the first time. So I immediately dive into this game, fall in love with it, start looking up pro players, obviously. And two people kept coming up in my searches, and that was Rambo and that was K-Shark. And so I very, very closely followed y'all's career, highlight plays. I mean, really, in a, in a, again, it's a big joke on the show because people know on the show that I idolize you from an esports perspective. And there's a funny story that I've been waiting. I've been waiting for years to be able to tell you this story. So back in 2001, 2002 timeframe, you had just joined onto Team 3D. You and a couple of your buddies come down to CompUSA here in Hearst, Texas. And it was a local little tournament. I have no idea why you decided to come there and embarrass anybody that you played against over there. But we had an opportunity to meet you at that event. You pulled up in your, I think it was like a white, prelude if i'm not mistaken back then that you, you might have had and we were like oh my god look at like look at this esports player bought a car living the dream we got a chance to play y'all in this event i you weren't with your team 3d i think it was just you and, and some of your friends that attended y'all smoked us i think it was like a complete shutout we did not get a map round against y'all but i did get something vital out of this meeting until this day it's changed my gaming habits forever when I first met you, I was using the arrow keys on my keyboard to move around. Didn't really PC game much. That seemed like the obvious, hey, this is how you would get around, right? You saw me playing and you came up to me and you go, you should use WASD. There's more keys around it for you to kind of navigate around the keyboard because you saw all of me and my whole crew using the arrow keys. We did change over to that immediately. And I, I thank you for that. So again, it was like a really... <laughs> really neat thing for me because obviously we all have inspirations in esports and Tim and I, you know, do this because we love esports and you know just want you to know and, and thank you, you know, for for everything you've done for for esports and just wanted to let you know that you're you're one of the uh, big dogs on this show. Yeah, I mean 2001, I mean that's like way back, you Way know? back. <laughs> I mean most people probably listening don't even know what CompUSA no, is. No, no, I agree. Easily. But it, it was like the best buy at the time. Yeah. Or or micro center and it was like this uh, store shout out go City. To your electronics <laughs> so they were one of our sponsors so they would you know hop around their stores and do little show meets and stuff but yeah i mean like back then like we were like still figuring out how to use the keyboard and like what the optimal like <laughs> yeah. bindings are so yeah i mean it's I, I don't remember that but it's funny i'm it's funny that I would say that. I would just be like, hey, you need to switch your shit. It's not working. It's <laughs> we were literally, they had us lined up back to back. So y'all were right behind us. Y'all were dominating us. And we were having fun with it. We knew we had no chance against you guys. And so you had peeked over and, and just, I guess, seen one of us doing something stupid over there. And we're like, you should use WASD. And we're like, all right, all right. We got If he says it, we should do it. So again, that that was definitely you know awesome for us. And you know, Tim and I have kind of been talking about this recently. Just Dallas has kind of become this mecca of esports, right? And we, you know, you have Dallas, you have LA. There's a couple of cities that you can maybe throw in contention. But but Dallas is really, I would say, if not at the top, right there along with, with some of the best places. And I wanted to get your take on that from somebody who's local from the DFW area, you know, grew up in Plano. Um, how have you seen that transition take place? And, and, you know, you've contributed to the growth. So just wanted to get your overall perspective on on the growth in DFW itself for esports. Yeah, so I think I think Dallas was the birthplace of esports. Um, I think it started around like 90, 1996, 1997. 
And thanks to the CPL, the Cyber Athlete Professional League, and QuakeCon, there were the two international gaming events that would happen in Dallas, Texas. And they were um, owned by id Software. So when Quake was you know, the pinnacle of esports, um, before Counter-Strike, they were having international events all here in Dallas. So all the best players from the world would fly down to compete here to be, to, you know, to try to claim the championship. And then when Counter-Strike came out, um, that's when the CPL kind of uh, was born. And that's when they also um, started using Counter-Strike. So, you know, lucky for me, I was here in Dallas and it was only a 30 minute drive. So uh, we were able to attend those events. So from like 1997 to like 2002, all the international events for Counter-Strike and Quake all happened in Dallas. Used to be at that Renaissance Hotel, right? I think is where they used to host a lot of these events at, and those lands and and all that. Yeah, I mean that it's it is crazy to see how it. You know, now we have the esports arena here. We have complexity here. We have Team NB here, and and I don't really see it. You know, kind of stopping anytime soon in this area. I remember you know, back. This had to have been like 2005. The Embassy Suite in Frisco, like where it's now. It, back then, it was in the middle of nowhere. But now it's all built up, right? Frisco and everything there. MLG was set there. Uh, and I remember thinking, like, esports will never get bigger than this. Like, I remember I looked at, we were like 14, 15 at the time. I looked at my friend that we went. And we were like, there's people here watching people play Halo. Like, this is nuts. And then, like Anuj said, I mean, Rambo, you saw it from the inside. Complexity, you weren't there to see it complete, but you, you saw the blueprints of how they were working with the Dallas Cowboys and everything, finishing that. Did, did Jason Lake and everything, like, did they consult with you as far as, hey, what should we have here for our players? Um, so, yeah, I was uh, with Complexity at the time when they were building out the headquarters at the Star, and um, I mentioned to them that they had to have some kind of replay room where the players and the coach and the staff and the analysts could go and load up the demos of the practice scrims. They could all sit down, put it on a big screen and be able to fast forward, pause, replay, and you know break down all the plays. So that's one of the rooms that they end up implemented there. And I actually got to visit there about two or three weeks ago. And it's incredible. It's like, you know, top notch, one of the best headquarters that I've, I've ever been to, obviously being funded and backed by Jerry Jones and the Cowboys and like literally being right on the corner of like the street of where the headquarters of where the Cowboys are. It's like prime location. So it's amazing what they've built over there. What do you think of the new complexity lineup? I, I think there's a lot of promise. I specifically and in particular like uh, the blame F pickup. Um, every time or every match that I've seen him play, he seems to like have this intuition of knowing how to, as, as on T side or offense, he like his timing, his intuition is impeccable. Like he'll always find the gaps. He'll find his way around the defense and like he'll find that flank timing. So his intuition and timing and feel for the game is really good. And plus I hear his worth that work ethic is like, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. Like, you know, what you would want from an in-game leader. If it's anything like his workout schedule, then I would assume he's, he's going to stay, stay <laughs> right. He's, over there. Yeah, he's like 21 years old, and he's built like Arnold Schwarzenegger really in his is. prime. It's, it's ridiculous. So that I, I have two questions now, because that actually spawns a question for you. But I want to ask you this one before I forget. From the outside looking in, as a coach, did it make you cringe? Or what did you think of when you saw Jason Lake's tweet? The famous uh, tweet. Which one? Which one? Uh, the one where he... I've seen many tweets. Which one? <laughs> the one where he pretty much called out his team after they lost at the major saying, hey, if anyone's interested coming here, DM me, let me know. Yeah, I saw that one. And I think it's justified. I mean, when you're representing the Dallas Cowboys, like I think they're valued the most yeah. valuable sports franchise in the world. When you have that kind of... Um, you know, you're representing that kind of brand um, and knowing how competitive Jason is, like he will not settle until he gets the best team in the world. So, um, you know, the, the showing that they had wasn't anything where it needed to be. So, you know, it was, it was a kind of like a public statement of, hey, 
I'm disappointed with what I have and I'm looking for players I can do better. So I, I felt like it was, you know, from outside looking in, it can seem a little harsh, but I, I can understand from his point of view, it, it, it felt justified. Yeah, I mean, and, and they did have their most success recently um, with you as their head coach. It was at the, what, the Face It Major um, London 2018. And you guys, you know, advanced easily throughout the challenger stage, I believe going three and one and then three and oh in legend stage and, and securing your, your legend spot. What was that experience like, you know, as a head coach? Because now the head coaches in Counter Strike are so embedded in part of the team. So obviously, for you being there, um, it really, really must have been something. What was that experience like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I first joined the team, we, we had a different roster. Um, we had some younger players on there that didn't have major experience or actually that much land experience. Um, and then the team that we um, ended up getting eighth at the major, it was you know, put together within like a, a month or two. So we put that team together and we had to qualify through the open online qualifier of NA. Like, literally the first step of qualifying for the major playing anybody literally at that point yeah like we were just the very like you know anyone can join the team it was a f complete free-for-all so we you know worked all the way up from that first stage all the way to top eight of a major so that was you know it was like a two-month three-month process for that whole thing so it was um amazing you know like it just um, you know, there's some times, especially during like the boot camp before the major, we had like boot camped in Germany for two weeks and we were getting absolutely shit on by <laughs> every single European team we played on. It was so demoralizing, but, you know, Warden being an amazing manager, he is. Um, and then, you know, you know, with me and then some of the players, we were able to take that experience and um, learn from it. And we put it all together during the major and, you know, we were able to upset a lot of teams there. That was definitely one of the more exciting teams with like EA and Death. There was like a lot of characters on that team and, and, and people fell in love with that complexity team. So, um, you know, definitely exciting. And, and now with you still being involved with Counter-Strike as much as you are, I kind of want to get, you know, you hear this in, in traditional sports all the time, right? We compare eras. Um, you know, what are the 90s Cowboys versus the, the 70s Cowboys like? Or what is this era of basketball if they played in Michael Jordan's era? How would they compare? Well, you were the best of the best in your time. You have been around the best of the best currently. How do the, the eras of Counter-Strike, although I understand different games to an extent, how do these eras compare to one another? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, if if I were like my answer to kind of generalize it to also incorporate the other sports is like current sports nowadays, whatever it is, they had people to learn and study from, from the past. So whether that's strategy or technique or um, practice regimen or whatever it is, like they had people to learn from nowadays. So back then when we played Counter-Strike in esports, we were the first ones doing it we didn't have anyone else to learn from. We didn't have other strats to, you know, we didn't have other in-game leaders or players or demos to learn from. I mean, people so were, we were using just... arrow keys to move. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was, yeah, there was people like that, you know? <laughs> so we were doing what, we were the innovators. We were the pioneers. We were just doing what we thought was the best thing to do and trying the best we could. So nowadays, like, the players are insanely skilled. They're getting better at a faster rate than we were in the past because they have all these other demos and other pros to learn from. So um, it's it's difficult. It, you can't. Uh, it's hard to compare because of that reason. No, and I I think that's a great answer. I think that's absolutely true. Is um, y'all did not have that previous generation to look up to, and that that kind of leads me into a question of in esports. Who did you look up to at that time? Like, where did that drive, that passion for gaming come from from you? You know, for Tim and I, we had people like you, right? So who was your version of you to, you know, to yourself? Yeah, um, I mean, I had some, I played other games too, beyond Counter-Strike. So I was fans of other gamers, um, like in particular, Warcraft 3. I was a big fan of Grubby and Moon. Um, Starcraft was Boxer. Um, in Quake 3, I was a big fan of um, this team called All Stars. They were from Sweden. So, like, 
you know, I was a fan of other esports games. I was a fan of those players. Uh, in terms of Counter Strike, um, I was a huge demo watcher, so I would watch tons of demos, especially from other regions and other teams, to try to look for other play styles or things we could learn. Um, I mean, there was tons of players out there that I that I like. Wally, um, there's a player named Wally from Sweden. I was a big fan of um, Alex from WNV. Um, so yeah, those those were some of the players that that I respected. On that same note, then as far as coaching goes, because it just seems like, and I could be way offline here, but you you do have like that coaching mentality, right? Like just looking behind you, I can tell you're a man of details as your head is perfectly framed by the objects <laughs> on the wall, and I know that's not. By an an accident, Rambo. That was purposely done. You can't convince <laughs> yeah. me otherwise. I, I mean, yeah, I am. I am a man. Oh, go, go I ahead. am a man of details. Um, <laughs> I think they matter. Um, I think if you take care of the details, the other results will follow. Um, so, so yeah. So, so for my question, then, when it comes to coaching inspiration, because Anuj, just, we've already talked about, it, like. That was such a rare thing in esports. Like I remember back in Halo days, you had coaches, and they were more in-game management because of times and weapon spawns and things like that. But they were very few and far between. Still, like, did you look at traditional sports for that coaching inspirations or anything like that? Um, in the past or during my playing career, I didn't. Um, I definitely do now. Um, as I've gotten older, I find inspiration from all over the place. Um, but back in the day, even when I competed, I always had a passion for, for learning the game and even teaching the game. Um, like when I was playing, I, I gave like 250 lessons and we wrote a, a counter-strike guide. So I was always a student of the game and I also liked teaching it too. I liked that the challenge of trying to share that knowledge. So, um, you know, it was just something that I always studied and during my playing career, it was just something that I always thought about like 24 seven, if I wasn't playing and I was like sleeping or trying to fall asleep, thinking about the game nonstop. What was it like being a esports athlete in the early 2000s? Obviously we, we see it nowadays. These guys are celebrities, right? I mean, they get recognized, um, obviously with all the social media, they're very visible to the public eye. Um, for you being, you know, the top of class for what you're doing what was that experience like you know as a professional did you did you feel stardom at all or you know anything you know how different was it than it would be right now yeah i think um it, my professional career really took off around like 2001 when we actually got full salaries and we were able to travel to any event and like our hotels were taken care of and at the time, that was like unheard of. That was like the best deal you could get in esports. So um, that actually allowed us to practice full time and you know not have to worry about getting a job. So we're able to practice and do that, and it, it's the dream. What can I say? It was we we're very fortunate to do what we we got to do. Um, we we're playing and competing and traveling the world full time, playing games. Um, and now, I mean. You know, I, I too kind of do worry where I would be right now, like say if I was born, you know, five, ten yeah. years later and see how I would would um, tend contend versus, you know, the current players right now. So but no, I'm happy with all my experience during gaming. Obviously, it wasn't we weren't playing for millions of dollars, but um, it you know, felt like I, it. Yeah. Yeah. We felt like it for yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. like, you know, some of the WCGs we won. I mean, that was a lot of money for a teenager. Yeah, for sure. I remember no, for, back in the day I played, uh, I don't know if you know this Rambo, but I, I was a semi-professional Rainbow Six, Vegas 1 and 2, semi-pro. Uh, we won $100 once at a tournament, and I walked into my job at Starbucks that next day and quit because I was going to become a professional gamer. <laughs> so here I am no, today. Yeah, naturally. <laughs> at the CompUSA tournament, they gave us the big checks. And so we got second place in that tournament and they took a big picture of us that we still have. And I'll actually, I'll post that on Twitter. I will go find that. And they have us all hand standing there with this massive check with all five of us. And I thought that was, I mean, that was the coolest thing in the world at that time. So I, I can't imagine what it was like at, you know, at the level that you guys were at. It's funny because for... we had, we had Clayster and Crim6 who play for uh, Dallas Empire for Call of Duty. And they said that they always get the question of, 
from kids now saying, hey, how do I become pro? How do we, I become pro? And I have to imagine your answer was similar to theirs, Rambo, but I'm curious on it, is when someone approaches you today, right? Say someone playing FPL or whatever, they want to get noticed. They want to go pro. It's completely different from when you went pro. So, I mean, what, what advice do you have to people nowadays who are wanting to do that? Yeah, I think the formula it for any game that I've seen amongst professional gamers is that there's simply no shortcut around putting the time in to it. So I feel like most pro gamers nowadays, they were growing up during the high school era, high school age, where they're living with their parents um, and they're able to play outside of school or high school um, from around 13 or 14 and they've gotten like two or three years of experience and then like after high school they have this period where they can go full time that seems to be a lot of like 80 percent of what the pros are now so you have to be able to put in eight to 12 hours every day for a year i mean for any game it's just the competition's too fierce like you have to put the time in you have to build that experience um and then but i think you can kind of shortcut that time too because now you could be more focused and intentional with how you use that practice time so now like back then i would just play public servers all day every day you know and i thought that was the best way to just practice stop but... in silver ones just yeah <laughs> just complete noobs with 300 ping with like 10 fps i thought it was god you know but <laughs> but yeah so i mean like you put the time in but also you got to be playing versus good competition um, you want to be playing with the best and against the best, because if you're playing with the best, you're learning from them. You're seeing them every time you die. You hear the communication. You you see how they play. You you hear how they think. You get their feedback. And then when you're playing against the best, and you're getting shit on or whatever it is, um, it really um, gives you an idea of where you need to be, like where you're at. But if you're starting to play with these pros and semi pros and you're starting to do pretty good, then that means you're on track. Like, you, you know, your skill level and your ability to think, your game sense and all that, your impact value, like it's, it's pretty close to pro level. Was there ever a thought for you during the CSGO lifespan to try and re-enter the scene as an actual, as a player? Um, I mean, after my after CGS, like this was probably like around seven or eight years after I'd gone professional, I thought about getting back into it as a pro, but um, I know what it takes to be a professional, and it takes eight to ten hours a day of play, and you have to be passionate and you need to have fun while you're practicing, and I just didn't have that with Counter Strike anymore. I just felt like I felt like I, I beat the game. Like there was nothing more I could learn. I had been in every situation. So it was more of just maintenance upkeep yeah. instead of more of learning and, and enjoying the game. I want to take this time then before we let you go to, to touch on two things here. Uh, I want to go over to your time at Cor in Korea. So obviously you have a Korean background, first generation American, if I'm not mistaken. I heard you mention that in a recent interview. Was there any pressure in that? Because Anuj, you are also first generation American, correct? Correct, yeah. And I know with Anuj, I've seen his parents, so much pressure, Rambo. You would never understand. For him not to fail in life and look at him, failed. But you have right. succeeded. But was there any pressure there, like convincing your parents to be like, hey, I'm first generation American son over here. I'm going to go play video games. Yeah, so I think um, I, I certainly had that pressure from my parents, um, especially being Korean and Asian. Um, it's all about academics and school and go to college and you know take that sec that safe career and path. Um, but I was also kind of lucky too because I was uh, the only child, and my parents were often at work, so my dad had to keep me entertained while they were gone. So he bought me like consoles and like computers and you know, like internet so I could entertain myself. <laughs> so, um, you know, anytime they're at work, I was able to play. And then um, eventually it got to a point where I was playing a little bit too much. So they would hide my keyboard and mouse <laughs> and, you know, I had to go find it and then, you know, I could play and then, you know, hide it back <laughs> when they were, before they got home. So 
I definitely had some of that pressure from my parents, but when I started being able to travel and I started getting a salary and stuff and they, they saw that it was actually bringing some value, um, they were fully supportive. And I know on our show, we always have the stereotype of if Korea ever really wanted to get a team and focus in a scene, so like whether it be Counter-Strike or just pick a game, right? Koreans always seem to be a top tier team in that respective esport. Now that's the stereotype on our show, but when you when you lived over there and when you coached over there, is that stereotype warranted? Like, do they just prep differently than Americans or Europeans do? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, that's something I've thought about a lot, actually. Um, you know, like you know, StarCraft. I think they kind of was the pioneer in the forefront of StarCraft and they dominated that because they were the first to start. Yeah. But then when League of Legends came out, when everyone had this fresh, clean slate, they were all still able to you know, be very successful in Overwatch. Um, I mean, they control the meta in Overwatch. It's like no one even bothers about what the meta is until the Koreans figure it out. Yeah, I, I don't... I mean, I'm trying to think if it's... I, there might be some cultural... Um, a factor to it they're i think koreans are super very disciplined i think they're one of those cultures where like when someone finds an interest they're kind of like all in right and you'll see this with golfers from koreans like as soon as they're little kids and they find an interest like their parents are like you know push them all in for that 100%. discipline and i think that mentality i kind of have it too like whenever i find of an interest in something i'm like super addictive or like I put all my time and effort into learning it and the best I can. So I don't know if it's genetics or culture, um, but I, I think a commonality that I've seen in Korea is that they're just super laser focused whenever they find something they enjoy. And maybe that's, I think the Japanese culture is kind of in that way too, where they like pick a discipline and they just focus their entire life on it and they just want to master it and they don't veer off. It's not like, you know, they, they try to master all these kinds of disciplines, just like this one thing that they love to do. Well, you, you heard it there. If you want to be the best at esports, you move to Korea. Game over. <laughs> no, you know, one, one thing I want to touch on before we, we do move on here is um, you tweeted out not too long ago, a couple months back, um, regarding Riot's FPS game, Project A. Um, and, and it looks like you had some involvement here. I, you know, obviously I, I don't know exactly what you're doing with them, but um, can you give us any insight as to maybe your thoughts on at least what you've seen of the game? Um, maybe what they're coming up with? Does it excite you? I mean, it just um, it, as much info as you can give there. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so I'm still under NDA, so I can't really say too much, but um, just for people that haven't seen my Project A interview, um, one of the senior game designers and map developers, uh, Volcano, he's been working at Riot Games for about four years. He's a former teammate of mine in Team 3D, and he invited me and nine other former veteran FPS players to come down and try their new FPS game called Project A. And they flew us down for four days, and um, they had to try this new game out about, it's been a while now, so about six months ago. And... Um, I could say that this could be potentially the next contending, like a top five FPS esports game. Um, and this was when I tested it about six, seven months ago. So um, I think they're on track, like the gameplay, the feel, the mechanics, um, the maps, um, everything about it, it just like screamed competitive esports FPS game. Um, and, and the people that they have working on it have that experience of being at the top level of FPS um, competition. So they've got the staff. They've got, obviously, the backing of Riot Games, which has League of Legends. That's huge. So they have the, the, it's, it's, uh, it's the biggest. It's developer, yeah. right? Yeah. Sure. So, so they have the infrastructure. And um, so I think this game, it's going to be, I think it's going to be a huge hit, huge hit. Did you like the combat style that they have where it is a shooter with it, but it looks like also class abilities as well as kind of what we got from the video that they posted like they had some you know obviously more like either whether it's magic or whatever you want to call it but do you like that combination that they're putting together there between the two i do i they're um so they're blending a mix of um abilities and classes and 
FPS shooting mechanics. And when I had played it at the time, I thought it was the right amount of mix, the right amount of blend. It wasn't overpowered or cheesy in one way or the other. Like it felt clean. It felt like it wasn't too over imbalanced. Um, it was it like, like the right amount. First. Absolutely a shooter first, 100% yeah. a shooter first. That's all, exciting. That's all we wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're already pumped about it. So I don't think shoot. they've released any additional information. I mean, I don't think there's no, no. any release dates or beta or anything announced for that, but we'll, we'll keep you all up to date as, as info comes out there. Yeah, well, yeah, I haven't heard any dates. Um, they were teasing, when we tried about six, seven months ago, they were teasing about a friends and family beta. Um, and again, when I played at the time, it was super polished. So um, I'm going to guess it's where they're going to have some kind of close, super close beta within mid of this year. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a complete, you know, I'm just throwing that on the air, yeah. but I crossed my fingers. Well, the game felt good when you played it. So that, that's the best we can hope for, right? So that, that's awesome. Yeah, so that's, that's definitely the next title that I'm looking at. Um, if there was a game that I might go back into coaching or even playing at some level, I think that might be it. Awesome. I, yeah, I'm looking forward to a, a new game as well. And I know right now what you're doing is your YouTube channel where you're pumping out content, FPS Coach, where you're giving out various advice. And I would almost say where it just doesn't pertain to FPS. Most of it does, like with your arm movement and everything here. But like your latest video, How to Avoid Tilt. Haven't been able to watch that one, but... Tim really needs Some to. Some might so. say I need it. <laughs> I, I will say just don't have bad teammates. And then you'll, you'll avoid tilt, right? right? Uh, maybe you can have your next video of how not to blame your teammates for everything. Um, but what kind of feedback have you gotten from that? Because... You always see these videos on YouTube of like, oh, do like, you know, the how to videos, but it's always by people who you don't really want to hear from. But like you, right, like you should be charging for your advice, right? People hire you to coach their professional teams and yet you're doing YouTube help videos like what what made you want to do something like that? Yeah, so um, after I parted ways with Cloud9, um, I like I've always had this passion and um, interest in coaching and teaching people. And I feel like I have all this like information and knowledge that I have. So I want to share that with people and help them get better at playing games and having more fun and enjoying what they you know like to do and hopefully pass along some life lessons or some things out of the games that they can use to make their lives better. Have you kind of relearned some things yourself as you're going back trying to think of like, like, like I loved the one where you talk about like the wrist position, right? Like, did you really have to almost like look at yourself and break down like, wait, how do, how do I do my wrist? Do I do this correctly or? Yeah. So, I mean, like every video that I put out, um, I spend a good amount of time thinking about exactly what I want to say and how I want to say it, the visuals and the sequence and all that, because when you put a video out, you can only do it pretty much one time. So like that topic, um, it might not seem like it, but I, you know, I put a decent amount of time in, into thinking about how I want to say it. And during that process, I certainly reinforced that more into my own um, knowledge, I guess, of myself. Like it helps me understand things a lot better. Yeah, like I said, I, I definitely appreciate it. I know some a lot of our listeners are actually new to CSGO, believe it or not. They find our podcast by wanting to get into CSGO more. So um, I, I always suggest them to check out your YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Ron Rambo Kim. That's also your Twitter. So everyone should go check him out there, follow his stuff, watch his YouTube, and learn the game. Uh, it's one of the easier probably more pain-free ways to learn Counter-Strike. You can't always just join a deathmatch server, but that's on you. Uh, before we let you go, Rambo, if I could get a what we call liner from you, uh, that's where if you've ever listened to a radio station, you can state your name, like, hey, this is Rambo, and you're listening to the center ring. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Ron Rambo Kim. And you, I've. That's how bad my memory. No, you're is. good. You're good. Oh. The center ring. The center ring. <laughs> the center ring. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try it again. <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? This is Ron Rambo Kim, and you are listening to the center ring.
We'll Nailed that. it. Second, Second time, time with the charm. charm. What a professional. <laughs> Excellent. Well, dude, no, no joke. It, it's a huge honor to have you on the show. We're both huge fans of you and just following your career throughout all these years. And uh, it's it's been great. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys.